Welcome to this module of Professor Messer's CompTIA A Plus certification training program. I'm James Messer, and in this module, we're going to talk about the tool bag. When you A plus professionals go from place to place, when you need to repair a system, when you need to perform preventive maintenance on a system, what is it that you're going to carry around with you and have available? And we're going to talk about what's in the tool bag. And this comes directly from the CompTIA exam objectives that you can download from their website. For the Essentials exam, Section 1.4 talks about performing that preventive maintenance and also talks about not just the tools that you need, but what cleaning materials you're going to need to make sure that these electronic systems remain up and running. The 602 exam, which is the a plus professional exam talks about recognizing the names and the characteristics and how you would use these tools. And we're going to talk about all of that in this module. Let's talk about some of the hardware you might take in your tool bag and take with you from place to place. We'll talk about what a multimeter is and how important it is to someone who works with electronics. We'll go through a listing of what the specialty tools are that you might need to provide some preventive maintenance and ongoing support uh, and so things you'll certainly need to know for the A plus exam. There's also some things called loopback plugs. And I'll explain to you why those are important and how in some aspects of even loading some software, you might need those loopback plugs. And finally, we'll talk about cleaning these systems and keeping them up and running, especially with printers and mice and the outside of systems. You need to know which products to use and what tools you can use to be able to clean these systems. The first piece of hardware we'll talk about is the multimeter. The multimeter is a, a component that allows you to measure a lot of different kinds of electrical voltages, resistances. It's able to find continuity between the, the two different probes that you have on a multimeter. It's often described as the Swiss Army knife of electrical measurement. And that's probably why it does so many different things. There's all kinds of meters out there that are available to you, some that can cost $5, others that cost uh, over $1,000. And they all have different uh, sensitivities and different levels of measurements and what they can do. My multimeter cost about 10 to $15 US. I bought it from an electronics parts store. Uh, it's not something that you oftentimes want to walk into a, uh, a home supply store to get a multimeter. You probably want to get online to one of these larger electronic shops and find one that's applicable to you. This is mine. It's from Metex. It's an ME11. I'm not even sure if they make them anymore. But it's one that provides me with the, you can see the dial on the front of it. There's a lot of different capabilities here. So let's talk about some of these multimeter functions. I can use my multimeter to plug it directly into a power outlet. It will tell you how much voltage is coming through here. And if you're ever wondering if there's a voltage problem, a brownout type situation, the multimeter will certainly tell you. I often use it on the other side of those wall boxes, those wall warts that you plug in to power up your routers and your switches and other electrical devices. It will tell you the DC voltage coming out of that once it's done the transformation from AC to DC to tell you if the problem is really in that box that you're plugging in. I also use it to check battery voltages. You can certainly use it to check the CMOS uh, battery power that's on the motherboard of your system. You can also use it just to check. Uh, regular batteries that you would use, alkaline batteries that you use in other components. And so it be, really does become very useful in a lot of different areas. There's a continuity check in these most multimeters that will tell you if you have the ability to get a signal from one end to the other. So I'll check cable co connectivity that way and make sure that my cable is, is in one piece from one end to the other. I also use that continuity if I ever need to check a fuse. It will tell you if that fuse has been blown or not. Very useful. When we talk about specialty toolkits, from an A-plus perspective, there are some purists that say you don't need a lot of different kinds of tools these days. For someone who's dealing primary, primarily with A-plus, you need a good screwdriver. And for the most part, that's absolutely true. You need a screwdriver that can have a lot of different types of Phillips head, cross head, uh, or have a slotted flat head view to it. Some cases, you'll run into specialty type screws, like a Torx screw. This is a six-pointed star. And you'll see that a lot on components that uh, that don't necessarily want you to be able to get into it very easily. If you've ever taken apart a hard drive, which you don't want to do, if you have a hard drive that's gone bad, it's oftentimes interesting to take it apart to see what's in there. Those will use Torx screws because it's not something that everybody should be opening up and getting into. If you take apart a hard drive, you've ruined it. It is an airtight 
uh, display in an airtight case. You don't want to break open a hard drive unless it's something that is completely broken. But some people have these all-in-one tool kits. Here's one that I've used that has a lot of different kinds of screwdrivers. It has a place to put your screws. It has some different chip pulling uh, pieces in there. And it's nice to have. Uh, obviously, if you're someone who has to travel around from place to place, you want to find that toolkit that's just right for you. And that's a pretty good toolkit to have for somebody who's in a home office like me that needs to be able to have access, be able to work on some of those other types of components. Another nice group of pieces of hardware you might want to have in your toolkit is loopback plugs. And these are really useful for testing a physical port when you don't have anything else to plug into it. If you've ever installed Windows 2000 before, during the Windows 2000 installation process, which is something you need to know for your A+, we're going to have a module on that, it, it checks to for a physical connectivity on an Ethernet port. And if you happen to be installing Windows 2000 on a system and you don't want to plug it into the network yet, a loopback plug can fool the system into thinking that you're plugged into a live network and allow you to proceed with the installation process. It's also useful. There's a number of troubleshooting capabilities in many of the network drivers today that require you able to loop back that connection or have a connection. A loopback plug becomes really useful for that. But loopback plugs are also good for serial connections. For the RS-232, the 9 or 25 pin serial connections, you'll often need a ability to to redirect the traffic back into a serial connection so you can test it. So if you hit a key, you can see that that key is being echoed back to you. And those are useful in those situations as well. For both the Ethernet and for even wide area network connections like T1, you'll find these loopback plugs can be very, very valuable. Now, these are not crossover cables. That's something a little bit different. Crossover cables are cables that take one signal, cross the signal over so that you can plug another device directly into it. These these are a little bit different in that they are taking the signal coming out of those ports and redirecting them right back into those ports again. So don't use those interchangeably. Those are two very different kinds of systems. And you can make your own Ethernet or crossover, a modem and a null modem, a Cisco console cable. This is a great one that I made for myself. I keep it in my bag. And it's at spacehopper.org slash 5-n-1. And that, that is a nice uh, ability to have a single cable that you just have different connectors you put onto the end so that your one cable turns into five different kinds of cables. So if you're someone who likes to make cables yourself, that's a good way that you can go about getting a lot of things done in a very small space, which is great if you're traveling from place to place. When you're in a situation where you have to provide preventive maintenance, that often means that you're going to be cleaning devices out. You're going to be cleaning the inside and the outside of computer components. And it's important to know what products are good to use to be able to maintain those systems. One that you see most often, probably in everything you read, is to use water that's on a damp cloth. Something you're not pouring water into your computer. That's not what I'm talking about. You don't want to do that. But using that on a damp cloth allows you to clean the inside and outside of different computer components, and you're not going to cause a problem with those. Sometimes you'll see specialized cleaning solutions being used, something like isopropyl alcohol. This is rubbing alcohol. I keep rubbing alcohol on my desk so I can pull it out and use it on a Q-tip, use it on something that won't have a lot of lint on it to be able to clean out parts of my printer or be able to clean out components that I have that will allow me to use alcohol. You don't want to use alcohol on everything. You want to check your manufacturer's instructions on what you happen to be cleaning. But it's a, a very nice contact cleaning solution. You'll often see that it, you want to use lint-free cloths. This is very important because lint, especially when it gets into connectors between electrical components, can create problems. You want to get rid of every possible piece that might be uh, might get in the way of connecting two different pieces of electronics together. So you could buy lint-free cloths at any office supply store. And those are very good to use when you're working inside of computer systems. Sometimes a manufacturer will include a cleaning kit in their system. If you've ever received a toner cartridge from a manufacturer, one, one of the things you'll find is there's pieces in there that you can use to clean out the, the real key components inside of a laser printer before adding the new toner cartridge. Cartridge. You also see them added with floppy drives. You can buy them to clean out optical drives. And you want to be sure and check with the manufacturer before using third-party cleaning kits like this. But those can often be very useful 
for cleaning something out that's specifically designed for that type of technology. Now make sure you understand that not all of these different cleaning components can be used across all different kinds of systems. Make sure you refer to the manufacturer's documentation when doing that. But there is one universal truth I do like to say, don't use a pencil eraser. You'll see that uh, a lot of old school people, especially when you want to clean off the end of those connectors on an interface card or at the edge of memory, those edge connectors, they use pencil erasers to clean those off. And no doubt you are cleaning some of that that off, just like you're erasing the lead off of a sheet of paper, you're erasing some of the gunk that's on there. The problem is that you're also leaving behind little pieces of pencil eraser, and you don't want to do that either. Make sure you get something specialized like rubbing alcohol or some type of contact cleaning solution instead. So now that we know what kind of cleaning products to use, what type of cleaning tools should we use with those products? You'll very often use lint-free swabs and cloths. I talked earlier about using Q-tips. They aren't really the cotton Q-tips. They're ones that have this lint-free connection on the end so that whenever I use them, I don't leave pieces of cotton inside the devices or in between the connectors when I put these devices back together. You can also use a vacuum cleaner to clean some of these out. You can buy these very small vacuum cleaners at office supply stores. And those vacuum cleaners are, are cleaners that are designed not to put out a lot of static electricity. If you've ever used a, a vacuum cleaner that's designed for a work environment out in the garage, you'll notice they build up a lot of static electricity. And if you've watched our module on electrostatic discharge, you'll know that's not a good idea. So make sure that the vacuum cleaner you use is specialized for this use and that it is a non-static vacuum. I also will use canned air, but I use it very sparingly. They're not very green. They have a lot of fluorocarbons in them. But they can be used if you need a tight bit of air over a really small area to blow something out of inside of a keyboard or inside of a computer system. Very often times, what they can do is spew up a lot of dust. So I, use, I make sure I don't use a whole lot of canned air. Use a vacuum cleaner instead. It works a little bit better. Now, the problem with these is they're often controlled. If you turn them upside down, they're, they're very dangerous because they put out a very cold, uh, cold liquid that will freeze your fingers. They'll, they'll cause problems. You, know, you can burn yourself with this. So it's not something you want to have out and available. And certainly if there's children around, if you're in a home office, make sure you don't have this available to them. Let them know it's not a toy. This is also something that's easily abused. This uh, component that's used to create this compressed air is something that uh, can also be used uh, very or abused in this case. And you'll find that if you purchase it sometimes, they'll ask for an ID to make sure that you aren't coming in and buying a lot of these systems and using them for something other than cleaning your computer system. So let's review what we've been looking at. For our tool bag, we want to be sure we've got a multimeter in there, that we've got the right kind of tools with our screwdrivers and perhaps some other specialty tools. Might want to have a few loopback plugs available with us as well. And finally, make sure we've got the right cleaning products for the task at hand. One thing that I have often done is gone out to Flickr, and if you've ever gone out there, there's a tag called What's in Your Bag. So if you're ever lo looking for other ideas of what you might want to put inside your tool bag, you can look and see what other people are doing inside of theirs. And that's at flickr.com slash photos slash tags slash what's in your bag. For other A-plus certification training materials, other videos, discussion forums, and much more, visit our website at freeaplus.com.